let's take two charges. Now we can align them however we want to without loss of generality. Let's keep them on the x-axis. Let's also put one of them on the origin. Let's name them 1 and 2. So if you've done this, then the position vector of 2 is going to be that line, let's call it R21, which is basically the distance between charge 2 and charge 1. Yeah, so R21 vector. And let's define F21 as the force felt by charge 2 because of charge 1. Yeah, so it's going to be, it's some vector. So we need a direction for it. Now we know the magnitude of this vector very easily, right? It's going to be just k into q1 into q2 by the magnitude of the distance between them squared. And what is that? It's the magnitude of this vector, r21 vector. So the magnitude of r21 vector squared will go there. But now we need a direction. Now for now, let's assume that these two are both positive. We might very soon find out that it's not required that we assume that, but let's assume for now that it's that both are positive. Then the direction of the force that one feels is going to be away from this charge, right? That's the force it's going to feel. So we need a vector in the same direction as your R21 vector, correct? So let's call that R21 cap. Let's put it there just for us to remember that that's a vector in the same direction as R21 with a magnitude of 1. But what's the value going to be? Go back to vectors, right? Yeah. How do you find the unit vector in a given direction if you already know some vector in that direction? Yeah, if you have some vector and when you look at that vector and you want a unit vector in that direction, all you have to do is take that vector and divide it by a scalar which is the magnitude of that vector. So that vector scaled down by its magnitude will give you the unit vector in that direction. Of course, I'm saying scaled down by imagining the vector to have a larger magnitude than one. If it had lesser, it will have to scale it up. But you know what I mean. So therefore, in general, what is it? That's right, R21 vector divided by the magnitude of R21 vector. So you replace R21 cap with that, then you can merge the square term with the single term below, you'll get, that's right, kq1, q2 by r21 magnitude, the magnitude of r21 vector, the whole q into r21 vector itself. Now, did you observe something? The fact that we assumed that both the charges are positive helped us in the beginning, but does it really matter? Does it matter if both were negative? If one was negative, the other was positive? Check it out, no? Just take a few moments off and see if it works even then. And look at the implications. Now that you're done with it, let's take two negatives and see what happens. Because two positives, you already know. So two negatives you take, negative and a negative. Q1 is negative, Q2 is negative, the product is going to be positive. Therefore, you get a vector that points in the direction of R21 vector itself, which is what we predict, because if both are negative, it's going to be a repulsion again. And if it's positive and negative, then you predict that the answer, the vector you get, is going to have a direction opposite to that of R21 vector, because minus into positive is negative. Which also makes sense because if these two are of opposing signs, our assumption for the model of electrostatics that we have says that these two will attract. So you're expecting that charge to feel a force towards the other charge. So do you observe the, the beauty of, of this particular equation? Or just a few symbols here is actually encapsulating a lot of long sentences that we've spoken. We said that like charges repel, unlike charges attract, the force is inverse square. In other words, it, it reduces with the square of distance between them and the force acting acts along the line that joins them, either in that direction or in this. All of this is encapsulated in this one particular form of the equation. And that's why vector forms and mathematics are beautiful.